Hello there, everyone, and happy non-traditional holidays, <laughs> because once again, this is the VD Clinic, and we can't do any holiday traditionally, That's at least not this winter holiday season. Uh, I am your host, as usual, Vanessa. And with me, as always, is Darren. Hi, Darren. Hello. Happy 58th episode, if I'm not mistaken. Something like that. Yes. Let's have I, some non-traditional mile markers and celebrate episode 58. <laughs> I, stopped, I stopped keeping track of episodes which i guess that's wrong of me i should have kept better track i i probably i have a spreadsheet somewhere but <laughs> it's just that every time i make the episode art i have to keep checking what number i'm doing so that's the only okay. reason i'm slightly aware okay it's like wait did i already do that number is that number yeah, wrong but, and then does that count the referral slips or not like see that's Probably not. It's chaos. It's chaos in our feed. It's chaos. Yeah. But that's There's quite all right. Kind of like our um, non-traditional holiday movie that we're doing this year is a little bit of chaos. Uh, we're doing Female Trouble, John Waters, and uh, 1974 cult classic um yeah and divine at her most divine i'm even wearing my divine socks <laughs> for this recording i'm wearing my cha-cha heels nice i certainly hope i get mine for christmas even though i don't celebrate christmas i'd like to get some cha-cha heels are you gonna fuck up somebody's tree <laughs> I know I I considered us doing that scene, but I, I don't think either one of us felt confident enough to portray Divine. As soon as you said it, I I was like, nope, that's a big nope. You could try if you want with your theater background and your better better skills, but yeah, I'm not gonna try that. I how can you compare? And there there's so many. Well, we'll get into it in a minute. But um, before we get into the movie, um, I wanted to just kind of, since it's been a while, let's kind of just touch base and see if there's anything ex interesting, exciting you've been watching or reading that you'd like to share with people. Yeah. Uh, first thing that came to mind was Amanda and I have been watching Yellow Jackets. How how is that? It's fucking awesome. I, I would love say. the cast. I love the cast. Yeah, well, uh, Juliette Lewis, Christina Ricci, Melanie it, it seems Linsky. Like, yeah, Melanie Linsky. She I is love her. Oh, she is one of the the main characters. And like, right now, do you know how much do you know about the show? A very limited amount. But from what I know about it and just the those three actresses alone, I'm sold. Because I'll see pretty much anything with any of them in it. Okay, yeah, it is. Like, seriously, Melanie Lindsay is the only reason I ever turned on an episode of Two and a Half Men. <laughs> <laughs> she Her was and Holland Taylor. Her and Holland Taylor. Like... <laughs> 
Oh, nice. Yeah. So it's kind of like I for shorthand, I think the way it was pitched was uh, a retelling of Lord of the Flies with women and girls. That, that's kind of a little feel I got. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, Juliette Lewis, Christina Ricci, and Melanie Linsky play adult versions, and there's uh, quite a lot of, uh, more people in the show. But right. they play adult versions of these girls who were all on a sports team in high school together, and on a trip to it's like state or nationals or whatever right they're playing their plane crashes somewhere in the middle of nowhere and uh there are all these little flashbacks and and things like that and uh i really don't want to say a whole lot more than that but i mean christina ricci plays and they do a really good job pairing them up with uh younger actors to play them in high school right and stuff you know juliette lewis plays the adult version of the bleach blonde black eyebrows girl that was into bikini kill and nirvana and yeah. stuff like that makes uh, sense <laughs> christina ricci kind of looks like at least at this point she kind of looks like michelle pfeiffer at the beginning of batman returns mm -hmm. like her yeah. hair is kind of yeah i've seen and she's got glasses and yeah i've seen some some trailers for it and and stills yeah but uh yeah i mean the show is definitely worth the free trial and probably the monthly fee at showtime i would say um it's i don't know how many more episodes there are this season but so far there have been four or five episodes and it's it's ratcheting i mean there's already already been some fucked up shit happening but yeah i feel like the episode that just aired uh last night as of recording i'm hearing a lot of people talk about how they're channeling early sam raimi for at least the the feel and some camera shots well and that's what i've kind of gotten from it from like the trailer and and clips i've seen is that i, I like the kind of visual aesthetic with it as well i mean like the story enough of the story that i did get and knowing them and the visual aspect i thought that there would be enough that i would be, at least be interested to some degree yeah i i would so it's good to hear that it's yeah it's good <laughs> it's it's pretty cool and i uh, i'm interested to see where they go and it is shot well and there are a lot of strong leads and uh i haven't heard this criticism but you know some people are like oh it's they're just putting women in a sh in a thing that was men it doesn't really put that forward Mm -hmm. you know as as strongly as some things do but it's 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 cool it's cool to see some of the differences i think that uh, because what and you know like lord of the flies they pretty much devolve immediately because whatever but and, and this one is a little closer to home because i they're not traveling outside the country you know it's not alive which I mean, they had to base a live where it was because it happened, but, <laughs> but, uh, it, it, it's pretty cool. You know, the, the flashbacks are to the past and then in the, the adult forums, it's modern day. Yeah. So, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think if it's, it was created by a man and a woman team, uh, I haven't heard anything about there being a second season, so I don't know if it's a one-off or anything like that, mm -hmm. but e each episode's close to an hour long, and um, I think there was some 
Donner Party influence also. I got that feel as well. Or a ravenous kind of feel. I wasn't sure if they were going in that <laughs> direction. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's yes. that's, that's kind of, I wasn't sure. They, <laughs> there have been a lot of illusions, I would say. I don't think anything, nothing... I'm not misleading anybody by saying nothing has been outwardly said, but there is a running line in the adults of people always saying, well, we know the official story, but what actually happened? And yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's one of the ones that we try to, <laughs> it, it's it's one of those ones that I feel like Amanda would be annoyed if I watched ahead of her and one of the ones where whenever we've got about that long of mm -hmm. TV that Danzig can't watch it's like well, we should probably get, get Yellow Jackets in so we're, we didn't watch the episode that came out yesterday um, yeah but it's yeah, it's that that's been pretty rad. And since we got that for that, Amanda told me about the show months and months ago. She just said, "Let me know when it's out, and we'll start watching it." She, I think she read about it in Bitch. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know I read about it in Bust. Um, oh, okay. a while ago. Um. Uh oh, sorry. Uh, I brain freeze for a second. Since we've got that, I've also been watching the new Dexter. Which okay. is, I feel like it's, did you watch the original run of the series? Uh, I watched it here and there. Okay. There's, there's a point. I, I feel like after, I think maybe season four, I started liking it a little less and was very upset with, how, well, not very upset, but I was like, oh, that's how it's going to end. But this one, this season so far, I feel like matches up to the better seasons that they had yeah. in the original run. Uh, it's pretty cool what they're doing. And there's a big focus on the missing indigenous women, you know, that just disappear yeah. and nobody seems to give a shit about. Right. And, uh, Oh God, what is his name? Clancy Brown is in mm -hmm. this season. And Okay. Uh but yeah, if you're just like, ah, I don't know, but it's pretty cool. I would say anybody that liked the first four seasons of Dexter, uh, don't be afraid. It's not a continuation of how it went out. It's it's creative enough that it almost sometimes feels like a bit of an apology <laughs> yeah uh but other than that i mean i've been doing a lot of uh guest spots to uh you know have uh, you, know, you know i love having conversations with people but also it's good to get out there and remind people about our show yeah so I watched Children of the Corn 666, something Isaac, uh, for... You took a bullet. I did. I did. But... Thank you. <laughs> I have not been able to bring myself to watch that one. <laughs> that is the... <laughs> Go ahead. I haven't been able to bring myself to watch that one. Just... It's... Stacey Keach yeah. is in it, so there's that. Oh, okay. Uh... Okay. As as a a doctor in the town, and I could watch him choose scenery. <laughs> he he most definitely does. Uh, I, mean, I feel he like it's always... also what... no. Don't he sometimes wrong. he's he's in the background, but he is. I think almost all of his scenes is just him and another person mm -hmm. in in a room. Uh, so he's got all of that chance to you know choose scenery and just make people uncomfortable and isaac the per the original actor for isaac 
returns, although it's I don't even listen to that episode. I think that's the next Children of the Corn one because uh, Duncan is doing all of the Children of the Corn movies on podcasts. That are his yeah, he is. Uh, so I think the next one that comes out, it should, it will probably be out by the time this episode comes out, since he puts out a hundred episodes a week. Is I mean, truthfully, I used to be able to listen to every single episode, like right when it came out and now it's so hard for me to keep up <laughs> i feel horrible <laughs> don't hate me duncan <laughs> i love your stuff but and he is the voice of our you know quarantine theater intro um and he left his indelible mark of night seed on this podcast but right <laughs> right when we did night breed and uh <laughs> that's but, right um, cabal exactly um but still and he yeah and he was here when we did ghost dog it's or true he, no he or did he he had to leave during that yeah yes. but still i mean i love duncan um and i guess also nostalgic for hanging out with duncan because like my Facebook feed as of like when we were recording this, it was like four years ago that he and his family came to New York and Patrick from Screen Queens and I got to get together with them. Yeah. To meet for <laughs> uh, dinner and drinks. And, and so. his, yeah. And, uh, what Patrick got to talk about, Baz. Of course. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to have we'll have to see if we can get Duncan back on here sometime soon. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be doing a, our annual true crime episode with him in a uh, week. Or I two. know. I'm jealous. Oh, uh, well, and you've probably seen both the movies. Already. I have. I'll I'll save it for the tournament, but that I went in totally blind on Dear Zachary. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. You know, I knew I was kind of again. I I knew I was on guard because Duncan had said something about how it moved his emotions, and he's generally like, "Oh, <laughs> fuck your tears." They're, you know, yeah. he's generally emotionally unmoved by things, but yeah, I, I had never heard of it and I didn't look at anything. I just found it and put it on. And so that, that was that, um, <laughs> but we might be doing some true crime later on next or sometime next year, you know, we, we usually have our March are. madness, if not before. I'm I'm still working on March Madness, but I do know of something else I'd like to do. And unfortunately, I it has been delayed. But um, yeah, I'm going to I've got to touch base with Bo on that. That's all I'll say. <laughs> um, anyway. Great. So anything else? No, uh, the only thing I've been reading is I did start our book for next month. Ah. I'm trying to finish a couple other books before I start the book for next month. Oh, uh, for your 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 end of year goal of yeah. reading? Yeah. Um, because I'm half well 60 percent through one and then had just started a new audio book and then i want to read tank girl before the end of the year because uh, i finally got a copy finally got it. i finally got that copy in the mail i mean i've read a few pages of it but not enough and i did actually read a very short comic um that i picked up in my neighborhood by um i'm guessing a local brooklyn artist um like just probably my neighborhood literally um 
So, yeah, it was pretty interesting. Um, but it was a very small comic, you know what I mean? It wasn't like a, an actual like volume of multiple issues. It was like an individual issue. You know uh, how comic, you know how comics yeah. can be serialized. Oh yeah. So, um, yeah. So I I don't count that towards my book challenge and <laughs> my reading challenge rather. But yeah, I have three books to go before the end of the year. So okay. Are you, how are you measuring up with? Is it an unofficial or is it an actual comparison with you and Lance? It's unofficial. <laughs> we both, you know, have shared our list with each other and everything to see what we've been reading. But what I actually just finished reading, I did the audiobook version of it. Um was the it was Sharon Stone's autobiography. Oh. And I did the audiobook because she narrated it. Okay, uh, cool. And, and what I had, and I, you know, and I'm not, she's not someone that I've always been like, so like super in love with, but I've always found her interesting. And I know she's done a lot of interest, you know, a lot of great charity work and that kind of thing. And I knew she had gone through some different medical challenges. And, and so when the book came out this year, um, there were, I read some interviews and saw some interviews with her about it and and read some excerpts from it and i was like wow it just sounded like a, a, a more interesting story than you realize there and it's partly it's actually interesting that i'm bringing this up because it's partly i forget the title of it i, I could look on my my audible but it's it's partly an examination of what is beauty and like the definition of getting labeled as a beauty and then here you're having to deal with all these medical things you know what i mean that where you're like going through like a brain aneurysm you know um you know different cancer type stuff i mean like and all of this horrible ugly health things as well as you know, custody, you know, divorce and custody battle, like type stuff, like ugly things in life. And here you're held to this purely skin deep standard and not held up as even the intelligence that you have. You know what I mean? It's it, which there's some of that that is things that get labeled on us, I think, as women in certain societies but this especially when you're talking about the like beauty the and celebrity status you know in that kind of realm mm -hmm. um which kind of goes along with <laughs> the movie <laughs> we watch a little bit but um yeah, it, it was just, it was really interesting. Oh, The Beauty of Living Twice. That's what it's called. Um, and, yeah, I recommend it. I mean, it's not the best biography or, or whatever I've ever read um, as far as writing style. But it's not like a super long book. And it is a good audio book because to hear her also telling her own story you feel the intimacy and you feel the emotion and as she's like i mean of course she's an actress but you can also tell where she's talking about personal parts of her life that really hit her on a different level you know um and it's more poignant, I think. Um, but it's it's an interesting enough story that it's a that it's a captivating read. And um, 
yeah and the work of i mean when she's talking about the different charities and and things too are interesting but uh yeah so i would recommend that and then again i'm still this one goes along with our movie as well in a way um the sense of crime and beauty <laughs> For Thanksgiving, my mother and I decided we were going to go to the movies, and we saw um, House of Gucci. Oh. Yes, which is a true crime type thing, of course, but it, um, uh, about the, the, um, basically the murder of Maurizio um gucci uh basically in the conspiracy of his like his wife and some other people to have him killed uh but and partly have controlling interest in in the gucci empire and just money and everything and i have to say i mean ridley scott directed it um for me he's hit or miss and i think overall it was a good movie, but it's really, it's an interesting enough story. And sure, I mean, the real true case is, I mean, if you see a documentary about it and hear interviews with the real um, Patrizia, who is the one who was behind all of it, you, you're just like, that is one that shit entitled Italian woman. <laughs> I mean, because it's a case of an entitled rich person and thinking they can have the fucked up Italian justice system wrapped around their finger and all these different things like, because the Italian justice system is notoriously kind of faulty um to put it nicely but it's i mean look at the amanda knox case uh just one instance but there are many other instances um so it's it's kind of like this is just this woman to begin with was completely batshit bananas and then the movie like lady gaga just she's she's earned her oscar nomination with this movie and i would not be surprised if she wins uh hmm. i mean seriously the performance is fantastic she transcends some of because you can tell see because the movie also has Jeremy Irons in it, Al Pacino, Jared Leto, who I have to say he does a pretty good job, but he's very much relies on prosthetics, um, I think, with some of his character. But he does a he does a he does a really good job in here too. But like Jeremy Irons, I mean, and and Al Pacino. You know, they're just not putting into the performances that they used to be able to, you know. Um, and I, I know they have, they partly aged them up in, you know, part of the movie. But I know that they're not as young as they used to be. But I'm also wondering, do they care as much? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Pacino seems to be having fun with it, and his role is a little bit more fun. But it actually, they all kind of seem to be having some fun with it. Uh, but in Adam Driver is the one in here that I'm kind of like. And Adam Driver is kind of hit or miss for me, you know. Like, I liked him in Black Klansman, but. I don't know. He can be kind of 
he's not he doesn't show as much range at times as i think he can okay and this was kind of one of those movies where i feel like he was holding back a little bit and i don't know if that was something he was told to do or if it was a choice i don't know if uh because you've seen the dead don't die right uh i have not oh okay his character in that is although a lot of the characters are seemingly underwhelmed by the things the drastic things that are going on in the movie but mm -hmm. i'm wondering if that's how he is in this because it's very well yeah that's that's unfortunate it's a it's a zombie it's a zombie apocalypse oh well, yeah and, <laughs> and that can work but I mean, in the proper context, in the proper context, it, but it's also like you, there are certain characters though, where the character itself in the story, and maybe this is a fault of the script, you know, where, or the director, that's what I'm saying. It could be the fault in the directing where a, 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 you know, a certain arc in the character emotionally needs to be pushed more. Yeah. You know, um, not every character calls for that. And you can maintain a subtleness in it through an entire film and it be correct and be good. Um, because there is such thing as a nuanced performance, but not every character calls for that nuanced performance is my point and i feel this character needed some you know needed to be pushed a little bit more emotionally in certain spots at least and i feel like adam driver just didn't push it but again that may have been a ridley scott thing might have been yeah but still, I recommend the movie because <laughs> even even though that's like my one, I mean, my my only real like thing that was the like the weakest link of that part of the, that movie. But it was still a good movie. It still didn't, didn't you know, detract from it, really, um, because most of the film we are with Lady Gaga's character. You know, I feel like, and she's delivering, she's like such the emotional powerhouse, this character. Because, you know, you can be, you can say, oh, she's chewing on the scenery and a little bit, but it's that character. Because when you see interviews with the real Patrizia, she chews scenery. I mean, she completely does. It's not, it's not a lie. <laughs> so like, and, and, and Gaga, the accent, you know, not too bad, I have to say. Hmm. You know, right some on. of the other accents in the movie are questionable, you know, are much more questionable, but hers isn't that bad. So, um, yeah. So that's what I did for my my Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So yeah, anyway. I know. Like you said, it had been a while since we had done one of those. Yeah, and I know I probably. I mean, like there've been more things along the way, and uh, I rewatched like the entire first season of reservation dogs for work like for a you know a discussion that we had there and so you know to rewatch that i you know i caught some some more things in that and there's just i'm so happy that's coming back for a second season i can't wait um i've already endorsed that on this show before <laughs> so i won't gush <laughs> again but 
send them back into our back catalog. Exactly. Anyway, on that note, we will take a brief break and then we will come back and get into some female trouble. Cha cha. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Cha cha. Cha cha. It's my cha cha heels. <laughs> you gotta make a sound. You gotta. Faye Ray. <laughs> Janet Lee. <laughs> Adrian King. <laughs> Heather Langenkamp, <laughs> Amy Steele, <laughs> that weatherman who saw the cockroach. That, oh my God, that is so shit. Oh my God. Jamie Lee Curtis, <laughs> and you. Come on, you know you wanna. Let her rip. <laughs> There. Now don't you feel better? You are now officially a Scream Queen. Come play with the rest of us at www.screamqueens.com. That's Queens with a Z. Or you could subscribe to us on iTunes. Either way, it's gonna be fucking fabulous. The Scream Queens Horror Podcast. It's where horror gets bent. And we are back with 1974's Female Trouble, the John Waters masterpiece, cult classic, insanity. <laughs> <laughs> Edited by, cinematography by, produced by, directed by, or what? Lyric it was, was co-edited, right? It wasn't yeah, like co he, he wrote... <laughs> He even wrote the lyrics to the theme song. <laughs> that Divine Sings. Yes, yes. Well, and that's what is great. This is like, this really cements to me. I mean, well, John Waters and his Dreamland Films universe, this cast and crew of people that he has always worked with like as many of them as possible over the years like un most of them until they died you know um van uh, smith one of them has worked behind the scenes forever um doing like production design and that kind of thing or i think it's van smith is it van smith or pat moran sorry I'm anyway, one of the two, it, it just recently died, like in the past couple years, but was even in this in the, you know, in the early days as like a small role because, well, this was only made for $25,000, <laughs> you know, didn't get the kind of funding that you saw that John Waters was getting by the time Hairspray came around. And I'm not talking about the musical. I'm on the fence about the musical. <laughs> it You're I, talking about the one that came out a couple years after this, right? Or when did, no, Hair, when did Hairspray Hairs come out? 88. Oh, okay. The so one with Ricky Lake. <laughs> Ricky Lake. It was Divine's last film. Um... And it had Jerry Stiller in it, Deborah Harry, um, Sonny Bono. Uh, who else did it have in it? Ruth Brown. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's like a classic movie. Plus, it had a bunch of these background people like in he, that are in here, like Susan Lowe and, uh, you know... It, Mink stole it. Mink stole. I mean, still yeah. in everything that he does. Taffy the, in this movie, right? Right, Taffy in this movie. But she also, she later moved to where she was just acting. But at this point, 
she did all the camera stills like was shooting like helping with that <laughs> of course like yeah that was one of the cool things i liked about uh or still do about john waters is yeah, uh, like a well, I don't want to say like a lot of people, but like many, I am sure my first John Waters movie was Cry Baby because my sister rented it. Yeah. And then it's sort of and then I found Serial Mom uh, and then sort of expanded into the back catalog much later. Well, and this was the follow up to Pink Flamingos. You know, which, I mean, granted, you know, John Waters had been doing movies before Pink Flamingos. I mean, I think really only like one, maybe two features before Pink Flamingos. But um, most people think of like, yeah, Pink Flamingos and then kind of this and then so forth yeah uh polyester is another popular one i think polyester uh, i i have that one um with the scratch and sniff card by the way that's <laughs> the um criterion collection edition so if you ever decide to get it it I mean, you don't have to scratch all of them, believe me, but <laughs> you'll have it. Um, but yeah, multiple Pecker, maniacs. Pecker came out when I was in high school. Pecker. I love Pecker. Um, Cecil B. Demented, A Dirty Shame. Oh, right. A Dirty Shame. That's really his last one. He did like some sort of like video after that like but he's mostly been writing and doing like his one man shows um since i mean a dirty shame came out in 2004 so coming up on yeah coming up on 20 years yeah which you know nothing wrong with that but he's also he's acting i mean cuz come on I mean, earlier this year, when we did Pride of Chucky, he was in Seed of Chucky. That's right. As the paparazzi guy. Um, he's been on a couple of episodes of Law & Order SVU is like a porn guy. <laughs> a, porn <laughs> a porn slash paparazzi type guy. Yeah. <laughs> there and I'm like, it's only fitting. It's only fitting. <laughs> which i will say when hairspray was made into a musical i, I wasn't so bad about the on stage version because like harvey firestein played the divine role the um okay. edna the edna turnblad role but when they turned it into a movie musical and John Travolta played that role. I had a real problem with that. I was thinking it was so miscast. They they could have had Harvey Firestein, I think, do it again. I think he would have been enough of a name, but whatever. Um, but at least in that, I will say they cast John Waters as the town flasher. I mean, <laughs> I'd give them that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't but, know if I've actually seen the musical with John Travolta. Well, and what and my problem with the musical is that it sanitizes the original movie a little too much. Hmm. It which what do you expect? It's like a PG kind of or PG. 13 well yeah, it's pg musical expect compared to something that was like more pg 13 and still <laughs> and still at that time john waters was considered a cult director he wasn't hairspray was like his first more quote-unquote mainstream thing and that was 
I mean, it was the first thing that had money behind it. But because polyester, yeah, that was 88 that Hairspray came out. And the previous thing he had done was 81, and that was polyester. And that didn't have a lot of money behind it, but it had at least some. I mean, Tab Hunter was in it, but not like Tab Hunter was getting paid tons of money in those days, you know? Yeah. And was uh, Mink Stoll's in that too, right? Of course. Of course. I forget what she says in this movie that is the exact same way she says it in Serial Mom. I forget which cuss word it is. I think it was like, anyway, one of the times where she yells like, you fucking bitch or motherfucker or something like that. I'm like, that is exactly like uh -huh. a cocksucker. Could be that. I, it's, it's hard. To, it, it was something that I just sort of mentally noted but didn't i'm not remembering clearly right now but i rewatched this last night yeah me too and it's like oh that's just like she says it. it well it's true there's so much that you see there's a lot that you see in this either kind of lines that come up again or certain themes that John the, Waters uh, yeah. will revisit in later movies. The misunderstood daughter. I think that house is uh, when they show the outside of the Davenport's house. Yeah. I think that is in Wanda's Cry house in Crybaby, right? No, and, it's a different one because she oh. goes down steps, but it's a different one in, in, in Crybaby. Okay. I think so. And it, it might, no, it's not one in Serial Mom. I have my friend, when we covered Serial Mom on the show, I know I mentioned that I have a friend who, like her parents, the house she grew up in and like where her parents live is around the corner from the house that they use like for the exterior for Serial Mom. <laughs> like, for the Sutpin family. <laughs> Kathleen. And like Kathleen. where they're driving around, like some of those scenes, like, yeah, doing the okay. chases. Yeah. Like the speed trap and. Yeah. And, break. And, and John Waters does use a lot of those again. But when you look at these early films, many of th these houses are like his own house or divine's house like their parents houses you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah where could we set up a camera <laughs> yeah what can we, we turn and... into the interior of a hotel just shove right. a couch just shove a couch up against the stairs well right and and so they didn't and, and they were also a lot of times wouldn't apply for the proper permits, um, you know, that Ed Wood School of Filmmaking, because it was like, oh, no, we don't want to have to pay the money. <laughs> you know, just like you're in it. Sometimes it was one take and go, you know, but then it would be like, okay, no, we just have someone there that's watching out for the police while the rest of us are doing our thing, you know. <laughs> And hope we can get more than one take in. It's it's you a know. passion. It's a it is always a work of passion and a, a need to film make. It's this kind of anarchy and guerrilla filmmaking that I I love. And even when John Waters, you know, as he evolves as an artist and gets more funding behind him and his films are more so-called mainstream there is still an element of anarchy and guerrilla filmmaking behind them because the fact the pure fact he still insists 
to this day that he shoots like that he, when he works on a film that he's creating he wants his crew and whatever as many cast members as possible to be based out of baltimore he wants the income there like it, it's also the environment that fed him and his creative spirit as he was growing up he's you know and that's that's why like by the time you see Cecil B. Demented, they're like, we're bringing, you know, the film commission to Baltimore, blah, blah, blah. And it's like this whole thing about how they're going to make Forrest Gump too. And maybe one day we'll do this, this film on the show. But it's kind of it, just how like, yeah, you go to these local, you know, the non big film, you know, the, you, you go outside the big, filming cities and you can still get talented people you know you don't have to be the elite hollywood or new york and i love new york where i live but yes it is an entertainment hub but i also know from having worked in theater in other parts of the country of the u.s that there are other plenty talented people in other cities you know and in other states you just have to be willing to look for it i mean the city where i grew up in alabama like that little area and its suburbs have in recent years been used for filming get out and um what's that other one uh not absentia oculus um and a couple like and some like Nicolas Cage and Steven Seagal type stuff like I mean you know <laughs> sure some of them are kind of like throwaway things but then but Get Out and Oculus like those were indie hits but still they gave these very talented directors you know they did bring in some local crew and local cast you know in addition to their people coming from hollywood or wherever so I, that's one thing i do love about john waters is that he has he keeps this certain love of baltimore and local talent there and yeah, and he's got his people and he's got like uh yeah, it it's a the John Waters culture or like you you said what are they called the Dreamland? It's the Dreamland film crew. Yeah. Dreamland film crew. Yeah, I <laughs> They try their damnedest. They 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 uh some of the lines, you know, some of the performances might rival some of our uh our quarantine theater well that is absolutely true and and you have someone like divine on one end who i think was just such a gifted performer and you can see as time of went on how his well her because divine is her name um the performer name um talents went on over the course you know by the time hairspray came along right but that's also you know john waters too like getting like figuring things out as a filmmaker too also maybe they weren't all as whacked out on as many crazy drugs <laughs> by that point <laughs> that might have helped um because this at this point they were still like very much like let's take a lot of acid and do shit um uh you know not just let's get high you know like not let's just smoke pot it was like no let's let's take some acid um that gives you a whole other perspective and 
And the fact that I think some of these people weren't even on drugs, they were just all in on the idea of going, yeah, just kind of not giving a fuck. Yeah, we are making a movie. We are having fun. We are helping John, who I imagine is one of the best friends to have. And, you know. well, and, and when you're talking about how some of these performers are questionable with their performances, I was going to bring up, particularly, like, there's there's one scene in here which is particularly painful when you look at the acting ability. It's between Edith Massey that plays Aunt Ida and Michael Potter that plays Gator. He is really, he really can act. Now, Edith Massey, I think she has her moments. But she has no one to help her push her along you know yeah. and in this scene and it's so it's kind of painful but she has an entire sensibility of she loves she particularly in this you can see it in this one particularly she has this great love of herself not like an egotistical way, but she she loves it, I, I think and I think it comes from the fact that John Waters appreciates her own special kind of beauty. And and he always sees a beauty in something that is not the traditional beauty standards. And we see a lot of that at play in this movie as a whole. Oh, right? yeah. Especially I, near the end there. Right. And I mean, it's, it is kind of a whole theme once the acid is thrown on, <laughs> you know, Don's face. And then defining what beauty is. Ooh, with the 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 big reveal, the band yeah. reveal thing, yeah, exactly. Ooh, I wish I had that. Amazing. Yeah, and and so it this whole film challenges us to challenges us to think, but from the very beginning, to question what is beautiful, like what do we think of as beautiful, and and I think that. John Waters and he knew he and his crew that he worked with he's worked with they he just knows how to cast the right people you know to meet whatever look that goes with the story you know because it is it is it's not just, I, I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of the character's look tells us, I mean, which is the actor's look even before or once you put them in costume. Because look at what they did in Crybaby with Hatchet Face, okay? That actress when you see her out of that makeup did not look like that but she had yes some distinct features and once they manipulated them with makeup they were able to make it into something more monstrous looking and that's what <laughs> we see even done here with divine's face um because as the movie goes on you see a mohawk to rival yours um in a couple incarnations <laughs> <laughs> um you know they 
It's a flat ironed masterpiece. I don't <laughs> flat iron and Aquanet. Oh, right, right. And but well, and the thing is is that David Lockery that plays Donald Dasher in here, he did most of the hair for this. You know, his, I mean, and I know he did, I think he did for Pink Flamingos as well. Um, but, and, but you see as Divine, or I mean, Don's hair is kind of like, more of it is shaved, like shaved back and everything the eye makeup and drawn eyebrows grow more extreme and go farther back on the head so that by the time you are at the end performance you know with the trampoline which i'm gonna get to that in a little bit <laughs> <laughs> but um it's the the eye the eye makeup goes almost actually i think it does go all the way to the nape of the neck like it, underneath the hairline in the back like all almost so the, the point almost so the points meet they don't quite but i mean it leaves like a little enough space for the spine and that's about it it's actually just and it's kind of an underneath that at that point you see all of this extra prosthetic for where it's supposed to be scars from the acid burns and so it really starts challenging you know and the what had been told to this character is that you are so beautiful and it had been repeated and repeated and repeated and So I and I think it's interesting throughout the movie, the incarnations. I know it's supposed to take place over a passage of time for the character, like starting in 1960. Uh and going until what at least like I guess 70 or something. I think the last thing I saw the last year update said five years later 1974 oh okay okay i couldn't remember that... i couldn't i i was trying i think i knew i missed some of the math in there that's um, that's right before the uh needle nose pliers scene you're correct yes <laughs> wow yeah so it all the looks that we see in here you know just you see so many of the looks that would influence these characters and some of the behavior and things that would influence hairspray years later you know in 1988 but um with the hair with the hair and with you know the exact outfits and that kind of thing because it's supposed to be the same time period but you then see in a few years, you see like these, this whole homage to Faster Pussycat, Kill Kill, you know, with the go-go dancing and the, th and the kind of girl gang, um, you know, very much like a, an homage to that kind of, um, that Russ, Russ Meyer kind of thing. Juvenile um, delinquency. Mm-hmm. And then you kind of see by the time, like then, like then by there's by the time there's the wedding or whatever, you see this whole Liz Taylor look, um, which I think Divine did say herself that she very much kind of felt a kindred spirit with uh, elizabeth taylor and so at one point did model herself physically <laughs> on liz taylor um and i don't you know and i know there was a point where elizabeth taylor was a little bit larger and 
so divine and drag could easily mimic, you know, do Liz Taylor as a drag queen. Um, which, to some degree, this divine in here seems to me like the like a punk drag queen version of Liz Taylor. Perfect. And yeah, and by the time you get to again, like this end performance that you see in the movie, that almost seems like if you were you were going to some show in a drag bar in Baltimore, like w the crazy kind of shit you would see divine do, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, maybe, you know, without the gun, but you know, I'm saying the other stuff, you know, maybe on the trampoline, carrying you know, newspapers, you know, playing around with a bunch of fish and a little pin, a little like play pin, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm there for it. I, I, you know, I, I think it, it's it's great, and I love the I love the crowd's reaction. It seems genuine. <laughs> um, I, I mean, don't you think? Yeah, I, I, I wondered if even part of it was. I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen. Yeah, I think so. Just react. It's like, holy shit. I can see them saying, we're not going to tell you what it is. We just want you to react. But we will occasionally put up a card for you to clap. <laughs> like, and, th and them just saying, but we're going to do it maybe twice and that's it. Everything else you have to have a natural reaction to. I mean, seriously, because that is the only part of it that seems like they tried to maybe, you know, get the timing right. Yeah. Or they yeah. said to the audience, if you're going to applaud, we ask that you hold your applause to the two places that we are going to put signs up. We'll have a flashing sign like they have for a TV audience. That is the only thing I can think that they said because it is so silent. I love the fact that it is silent except for like the bouncing on the trampoline and the shaking of the, the beads of the that are on the jumpsuit, you know, and the tearing of the newspaper. And Divine's <laughs> little grunting. I mean, like, it, <laughs> there isn't any score at that point. None whatsoever. And it's hard to get away with that. And considering the way the scene is built up, you would, it's very surprising there is no music. But yeah, it works perfectly. It probably puts emphasis. I think it works perfectly. And, you know, I had said, I think, when we announced this, that I'm pretty sure I won my copy of the movie f when I was a listener to the VD Clinic. And I had sent in some sort of answer to a trivia question. Oh, yes. Yes. Because I, I somehow was sent two copies of it when I ordered it. And I could not find the proof, but you seem to remember it better now. Yes. But I believe you were skeptical uh, when I said it. But yeah, I, I went now, through now trying to find. Now that you say that, I remember. I remember because it was when I had bought my Criterion version of it. And they accidentally sent me two copies of it like separately and and so i was like well okay and i couldn't remember who got it it was me there you go 
And yeah, so we so, watched the same uh, version. We did. Okay, so I wanted to ask you. Okay, I before we do, I I love the line where the Don Davenport. There's so many good lines in here, but okay, like Edith Massey, like the Aunt Ida character talking to Gator and saying trying to make him gay and saying. I just don't understand it. I mean, queers are just better, you know, <laughs> like in her whole thing where she's just trying to set him up with a nice guy. If they're um, smart, they're gay. If they're dumb, they're straight. Right? Exactly. Sure. Um, but it's, uh, but when Taffy, I, I, there, but, um, Dawn is trying to convince Taffy of her supposed mental um, disabilities, you know, which I don't think there's anything wrong with Taffy other than she just needed to go to school and be able to make friends and live like a normal kid life. You know what I mean? Right, which Dawn has an obvious aversion to because of that asshole teacher that she has at the beginning of the movie. Right, um, right. Uh, so they already established that it's not that Taffy has, there's anything like wrong with her IQ. It's just the fact she hasn't been given an opportunity. Um, But so, but I still love Dawn's line when she's trying to, talk about that and says my genes were polluted by your birth <laughs> <laughs> like not your genes were polluted you know it was right it's very it's, dawn thinks about dawn and the world and how it affects dawn exactly because, because she's a what i'm a thief and a shit kicker and i'd like to be famous i know i love it i love it I know. And then, like, was it one of Dawn's friends when they see Taffy misbehaving? She's like, I'm glad I had my abortion. <laughs> <laughs> or when Divine tells themselves over the phone, because they played uh, the father of Divine's the baby child daddy. also, right? What, is, what was her name? Taffy. Something Peterson? Earl. Earl. Uh, Earl Peterson. Earl Peterson. Yeah, which is interesting because not only does, er, you know, is it Earl Peterson, the baby daddy, Earl Peterson also rapist of his own daughter, Taffy. <laughs> oh, but it's interesting that's... that this is the second film on VD Clinic where we have seen an actor of one gender play characters of two different genders um you know it one of which is involved in sexual assault so in some way so <laughs> i'm just saying it's it's yeah it's wait 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 which one was that liquid was sky other? oh fuck all that shrimp made me forget about that part I know, right? <laughs> Both movies picked by you, by the way. I I didn't think about the sexual assault aspect, but um, the gender bending I I knew was there. I mean, you know. Yeah. That, oh, that. <laughs> I like. Uh, speaking of taffy, I I I don't know why, but this, especially this time around. The car wreck game really cracked me up. Oh, I agree. I agree. And you know what? This time around, I actually kind of appreciated the the one that played Taffy as a younger child. Oh, jump the jump rope era? Yeah. Like, for a child actor, she was actually pretty good. 
and to I mean and to hold her own against the these this crew like wow I was impressed yeah that was good and what it was a friend or a crew member's baby in the birthing scene right yeah of course it's like oh you got a baby great slap some fake blood on it <laughs> and I'll get my shot yeah exactly um, but yeah, the young, I feel, I don't, I don't know if I saw the, who played young Taffy. Um, it's Hillary Taylor. Oh, okay. But Did I, she... you know, there are just, there are just so many little things there that like, I, I just, to begin with, I love like the, they're just all the little John Waters touches that you see in this that you th see throughout so many of his films that i always love like naming a character like with the same initials like don davenport donald dasher donna dasher i mean not all, it doesn't you know n not all of the characters like that but it's still kind of like it's just he always manages to get at least a you know a handful of those in and it's just always like one of those you know his like little signature things yeah um trying to think but, of yeah go ahead um but i was gonna say you know this movie like goes through this like it has these issues of like child abuse and spousal abuse and parental neglect you know like these kinds of th these heavy duty issues you know and the way that they're kind of carried out are hysterical even though these are issues that in real life are horrifying like the i mean just like even the scene with the young taffy where they take her up to the attic or whatever to put her up in, like, lock her up in this room in chains on a bed. Like, the lighting on that, I mean, for a second, like, if you took it out of the context of it being a John Waters movie, that would be, like, some true crime house of horrors bullshit. <laughs> you know, child services called. <laughs> at the very least if not you know you're taking taking away parents or something you know to be locked away forever because they've got children buried underneath the basement floor <laughs> yeah there there would probably be charges filed at the very there least. would definitely be charges filed like yeah um it would be but it's just it and this whole notion of crime and beauty as one is is a very it's a very fascinating one and you can see it's interesting to me like as much as i've paid attention to the fashion world over the years and um and even in the art world seeing how those two concepts have been portrayed like intertwined uh you know it, it doesn't seem like it, it what we see here and some of the ogling the classes ogling that we see here um like when donald and donna dasher come to uh, come over to don's for the spaghetti dinner that ends <laughs> with it on the wall That's just right. the way that they're reacting while they're going like walking down whatever alley to get to the front door like oh they're going to the wrong side of the tracks oh no how exciting it'll only make our artwork better yeah. meanwhile this is yeah. someone's reality and you know like what you 
are you exploiting it or are you helping to bring light to a situation you know it, it's kind of like where and i'm not saying you can't take artistic pictures of a so-called ghetto of sorts but or an area of a lower income but it it it's depends on how it's played out you right, know it's kind of like john waters in the right way is showing someone else doing it in the wrong way exactly exactly and he plays on this again with in pecker too yeah i wonder if that's the same camera that pecker uses that uh don donald dasher has i don't know well i don't know it's one it, i think it was one of john waters because i mean don't forget like john waters was also a still photographer so he's done a lot of the like by the time i think pecker came around i think actually even all of those that you see in pecker are ones that he took going around the city of baltimore i would believe that immediately um but you know i don't know i mean but like i said i know in this one you had Mink Stoll, who was working on a lot, uh, uh, was working on the this, you know, a lot of stills for it, you know, and it might have just been, well, John Waters was wearing too many hats, <laughs> and it was kind <laughs> of like, can you just deal with this for the movie? Um, you're already supposed to be taking pictures as part of your care, you know, as your character. It makes sense anyway, right? You know right. that she and Donald Lockhart would be the ones taking care of that, um, but if Don Locker, Don Don Lockery was doing, you know, also doing hair. You know, <laughs> you got to figure out when people are multitasking where they can best work. But yeah, I think, I mean, I one of my favorite scenes in here is when at, when. Dawn has decided to divorce Gator and she is breaking the news to uh, Taffy. And it's what Taffy has just been driving, right? Is that when that is? Mm. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, you're right. I, lo I, I do love Taffy with the driving scene. I hadn't, I had forgotten how just, yeah. I had forgotten just how quite amazing Mink Stoll is in this movie. <laughs> I mean, really, I was watching it this time and I was like, oh my God, she is, she's just phenomenal. She's just phenomenal. But, but anyway, so you've got this whole exchange between Taffy and Dawn there. And then Dawn goes over to the base of the stairs and looks back in this sweeping, very Betty Davis manner. Because <laughs> she just is like, says something about like, I'm a divorced woman and now the world is mine or something like however she words it. And then My like, life is mine or something. Yeah. Yeah. Throws her head and her shoulders back and like glides up the stairs. And it is just like so classic Hollywood in this like, teeny tiny like suburban like baltimore home <laughs> like it's not the big set they you know that they could do like properly do that on in the big days they don't have you know the the budget behind it but they still try to pull off that shot and you know and divine just is just perfect i mean but i was like oh i love it i love it and the staging of it is what it just makes it work, you know, not just the performances, but that, but the way it's staged. So, um, I don't know. There were just little things like, I love that once Ida is kept up in the cage, Taffy 
asks her if she wants some eggs. And remember Edith Massey, who plays Ida, was always look waiting for the egg man <laughs> in Pink Flamingos. Oh, right. <laughs> so that's a little throwback there. Mom doesn't buy food. There might be some eggs in there. Or so, yeah. Just the commonplace neglect. The taffy just like this is how yeah this is how this is how the, my world is and i had a lot more fun with with this i know we're not done but yeah uh that i i was i was like oh, okay i've i've seen it maybe two times before ever mm -hmm. and this was one of the more fun times through it and I, I don't know if it was because I was trying to think about it in mm -hmm. artistic terms rather than there's a movie on. And and that's one of the cool things about <laughs> John Waters' brand of trash is yeah. that there's always seems to be a lot more art to it than you than on the surface. Well, and even like just the whole thing in here about where they end up getting so addicted to beauty and the concept of beauty that Don starts mainlining liquid eyeliner. I mean, I love my liquid eyeliner, but not that much. Um, don't worry, folks. Um, <laughs> but, but that's kind of like the precursor to like the Botox craze in a way. Yeah. I, I mean, that's what it says it, like in, and you know, and lip injections, like that's what it speaks to me as, you know, not that sure plastic surgery didn't exist in 74, but not like now, um, you know, Botox really, I don't think that was really so much developed more until like the nineties, right? That's probably around when I first started hearing references to it. But I I would imagine that it could be longer because of how naturally uh, uh, naturally occurring it is. I I wonder how mm -hmm. it became a thing. You know, somebody somehow accidentally did it, and then it became a thing. Well, I know, because I suffer from migraines, it was originally made or created for people who suffer from migraines. And I think they realized once that was started, hey, look, there's this side effect. And then it kind of evolved from there, you know, because I have had Botox treatments for migraines. Uh, like when my migraines were extreme, extreme, extreme. Um, thankfully, they're much better now than they used to be, but they were terrible for a while. And um, I mean, I still take it like a daily preventative type thing and I have prescription meds if I do get one but um they're much more manageable now um and much less frequent but you know it it's still it's just kind of like I know how it would make my head feel after I had one of those and I'm like I don't like this feeling at all because I like to have emotion in my forehead <laughs> like I don't understand people who do it all the time for like beauty treatments. I know that you put it, you get the injections in different places in your, your, your head. Um, because for like Botox, I mean that for the migraine treatment, I had to have like 31 injections in my head and neck for it. 
Oof. Yeah. Um, and you don't really have any, you know, cushioning up in there. Yeah. But they were in places where, for the most part, you couldn't, it wouldn't affect, like, um, wrinkles, you know. Um, so, but, and I even know from just those spots, I was kind of like, I, I, I can't feel the part of my head my part of my forehead or whatever very well where I can move it to, you know, make a facial expression. So I can't imagine where they do put it like more into those spots where we usually form wrinkles, you know, as we age. Um, that just, uh, I like showing emotion too much, but that's just <laughs> me. <laughs> that's just you. I mean, but hey, if if that's your thing that you want to do that, like, I'm not going to stop you. Just be careful. Just be careful. That's all I say. Uh, yeah. Yeah. A quick a quick look says that it was a uh, first uh, botula the what the botulonium toxin or whatever was mm -hmm. first discovered by a Belgian scientist in the 20s, the 1920s. Yeah. I guess I have to say because it's. I need to sound extra old and say 1920s, but it it's is accurate at this point. <laughs> at this point, yeah, a uh, hundred years ago, <laughs> but also that it's really started trending cosmetically around 1990 or in the 90s. So you were correct. Yeah, like that, that, that seemed about right. I mean, like I said, they could have started working with like the migraine patients like in the 80s even i hmm. could see that then by the time 1990 91 came around then they were like we're going to start using it cosmetically yeah so. so so there's that yeah but it i mean but still like i said this whole concept of them in here being addicted to beauty and living for beauty you know and and so many of, you know, the, the, um, did you, while I'm going through the rest of my notes, do you have anything else to say? About female trouble? I mean, yeah. I, I, I enjoy the use of music. I like the, the over-exaggerated sound effects or, uh, say how gross going all the way back to the beginning, but you know, how gross john waters made if you can imagine it being gross to have like sex in the rain on christmas in a junkyard on a bare mattress with a shit stained underwear partner it john waters manages to make it even more gross well he does and but what is partly it's just yeah, I know. And it this what this is why this is one of the reasons why he is the Pope of Trash. <laughs> and he wears that title proudly. And and I will you know, and I and I I love him so much. Like he's one of my favorite directors. I have to say um i've read some of his books i've enjoyed those um i have yet to see a one person show like in person you know i've seen them like clips of them and such but i haven't seen one in person um and you know he i have his valentine's album I do not have his Christmas album, which I don't know if I can do that because even though it's John Waters, it's Christmas is a bridge too far for me. But <laughs> um, it, no, and the thing is, is that I don't know. Have you heard it? No. Although I do since, like since this weird is Christmas albums. Yes, yeah, since this is our our holiday show, like I have to I have to bring this up. Um. 
you know, it's, it's like, I, I love his Valentine's album because it's so kitschy and everything, but then you look at the Christmas album, it's kitschy as well. I mean, now they are, some of them are regular, like Christmas songs, but they're just like, for instance, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer done by Tiny Tim. Like, <laughs> you know, like, that's not a usual rendition. Um, but you have some other ones that, like Alvin and the Chipmunk Sleigh Ride. Like, that's a, that's a, a little bit more normal. But that's, that's about as normal as you get on here, you know? <laughs> Um, yeah. Yeah. Get... But... <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm just saying it, it's just funny that, that that's what you, you know, it, you, you just, it, it's fun though. Cause it's like, oh, okay. You know, just something different. Like one of the songs, Santa Claus is a black man. I mean, which yes. My, I believe my, it. My go-to Christmas album usually is the Vandals one, Oi to the World. And for those unfamiliar with that, it's got it, it does have a musical version of Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairies. But uh -huh. other, other than that, you know, there's Grandpa's Last Christmas, Hang Myself from the Tree. Thanks for nothing. Uh, stuff stuff like that. Uh, Bad Religion did a Christmas album, but it's all just Bad Religion doing traditional Christmas songs. Mm -hmm. So there's Little Drummer Boy or whatever and Park the I, Herald and all that stuff. I, I wanna, usually don't listen to that that much. Have you checked out this year's Eight Days of Hanukkah by the Foo Fighters. No, not yet. I meant to. I've only seen like part of one, well, and part of another. And I've really enjoyed them. And so now I'm like, I want to go through and watch all of them. Um, yeah, I, I love it. I love it. Hanukkah doesn't get enough love with the with the holiday songs. It's funny in school growing up. Did you ever, I mean, did you ever have to get together and sing in school holiday shows for like your parents? Hello. Sorry. I was sorry. I muted my microphone to cough and oh, okay. forgot to turn it back on. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I was in choir all the way up through high school. Ah. And I was even in a competing singing choir in junior high. So there were many, many times uncomfortably wearing, because I liked to sing, but I didn't like wearing dress up clothes and singing for a bunch of other people's parents. So yeah. I eventually got into doing more fun music, but right. yes, to long rambly answer short or not short at all. Yes, I have. Why do you ask? Uh, no, I was just, I, I was just curious. Uh, no, because I had to as well. When more though, when I went to the all girls school, and in Alabama, and it was funny because, well, it wasn't funny that there weren't that many Jewish people at the school, but it was funny that I a non-Jew was always put in the groups to sing the Jewish songs with the Jewish kids. <laughs> always. And, and then like over the years, like I've ended up, like I worked, ended up working at a Jewish community center for like five years. Now I'm in Brooklyn and I'm like, Oh yeah. Okay. I, <laughs> I'm like Jewish by proxy. <laughs> practically. Yeah, yeah gotta be around your kindred people um. <laughs> but it's i mean it's just kind of funny though that because it was like 
I don't know how they ever just decided to to they because they decided oh one year they were going to stick me there and then oh well you were there before so you know already know some of the songs you know we'll stick you there again I don't know like <laughs> I don't know if it was an anti-semitic reason I it was the south I don't know but um i i hope to think that they were just lazy and decided oh well i already knew the songs and <laughs> that's where they stuck me again yeah it it's hard to say with people that don't pay much attention to other religions or just really quick to to snap into well you must you it, must you know, need to blank yeah, and it's not like I cared. I mean, you know, I'm not complaining about it, but I find it curious. That's <laughs> all I'm pointing out. There you go. But yeah, we, uh, I don't know. I don't know what I was going to say. Yeah, also, there was a lot more religious themed music when I went to St. Mary's. Of course. Of course. Uh, well, but, I mean, yeah. the school that the girls school that I'm talking to talking about was a non-denominational one. Mm. But they they were a little bit more like they were more Judeo-Christian. They in, were low key denominational. Their, <laughs> they were non-denominational officially, but they they had that that leaning that way unofficially the they, were, they were still officially a private school in in the south yeah so at least we did have a mix of religions at that school it wasn't just all baptist it wasn't just all catholic you know because actually the where i grew up in alabama did have it or does have a sizable catholic community which for being the bible belt you don't hear much about that like you think yeah. more like baptists or pentecostal or something Methodist. and that is the majority but in like the part where i grew up was catholicism was pretty sizable the baptists ended up trying to buy land from the catholics the catholics only sold them the land because of the church you know abuse scandals <laughs> hush money is not cheap no i know we went on a tangent but i feel like this still goes along with john waters because i know he addresses those kind of um yeah. he's he's always poking at catholicism full of grace it, i was just gonna say that full of grace <laughs> um i love that movie um but is um i guess the only other stuff that i wanted to say about female trouble um was so by the time they're at the prison after the performance and the i'm with the gun and yeah okay do you think that facility where they filmed was a real prison or like a mental hospital because i was thinking it could technically be either like a like that has a ward for like criminally insane mm -hmm. like with some of the bars but but it could also be a prison I was wondering That's, about that last night also. Yeah, because that does not look like a jail to me. That is that's a place that has a facility. Well, except for like Rikers. <laughs> I take that back. But Rikers <laughs> wouldn't let them film it. It would have to be in Baltimore in that area. Um and I forget Mar Maryland's death row is not i don't think it's in baltimore um well and when I, the movie was made oh the death penalty the was penalty, on hold. 
Oh, it was, you're right. Actually, the death penalty. It was like was reinstated the day no. before the screening or something like that. Yeah, right? it had been out. It had been outlawed, actually. Yeah. No, it had been outlawed completely, but then they brought it back in 76. So. Yeah, no, it was still outlawed. And, and you see themes about the death penalty come back up in like Pecker. I mean, not Pecker, but um, Serial Mom. Yep. You know, it, and John Waters. And, and you see it in Crybaby, too, actually. Um, John Waters. Very fascinated by criminals and capital punishment. I mean, like he did go to trial with at least one of the Manson girls. He's gone to all these different trials over the years um and and he, he here we see him exploring this kind of idea before it really does become a big thing in american society this whole celebrity of a criminal this celebrity of a death row inmate you know, with lots of groupies. Yeah, because and the, the speech, the speech, the the speech at the end. Of what it was about like I do this for you. Without yeah. you, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be this big. Right, and but even like in the in the prison, walking to the electric chamber. Don is reaching forward, you know, through the cells, like saying goodbye to everyone. And they're getting her autograph and stuff. And not just saying goodbye, but getting her autograph. Like, that's a, you know, it just, it, it, it kind of predates this era of the serial killer and how the serial killer beginning i would say with ted bundy becomes not that there weren't serial killers before that but really the formation of the word serial killer the phrase serial killer also to see when it begins it is in the later 70s early you know and Richard Speck gets mentioned in at least exactly. the second John Waters movie that I'm aware I of. I know. I know. But I'm saying, like, but the fact that the way Ted Bundy was so his capture and execution and all this like received such publicity and he how he had so many groupies while on death row, how many like Richard Ramirez had for all those years and that dumbass i'm against the i'm against the death penalty but that dumbass just ended up dying of natural causes um from cancer he could have at least died off earlier <laughs> you know and done us all a favor there um he lived a little too long uh, but you know it's just because unfortunately, we do see people receiving, like being sentenced to the death penalty, who one, either are innocent of the crime and for whatever in reason ended up behind bars, or yes, they're guilty of the crime, but they're unjustly, you know punished like like sentencing isn't carried out fairly like even like so you can't like sentencing's not carried out fairly it's that's part of the problem too so you know there are disparities in sentencing um like racial disparities and you know if you're poor you don't have you know the same chance too as someone who's right. rich um you know, because that even if that rich person ends up getting convicted, 
of whatever crime, they're not going to get, you know, they're not going to get the death penalty. They're going to get life in prison without parole before that. You know, yeah. that's so, I mean, that's my little soapbox, but <laughs> I mean, John Waters explores these issues here. He, he does it in a way without it overtly being an issue. And it just, only he can play with these issues, I feel, and these horrible issues and just kind of make them hysterical. Yeah. Because it's everything is so ridiculous and over the top that we are conscious of the fact that we can, you know, we it's so far separated from like a true crime story or something. It, it's not, you know, it's not a drama or a recreation. You know, we don't have these these deep emotional connections. You know, because we might even look at Taffy, you know, ha throwing a tantrum like we would maybe some kid in public, some stranger's child, and say, you know, whatever. Like, oh, I'm so glad I don't have to go home to that. I mean, <laughs> or whatever, we, you know, at the very least say that. Right. This We've was a good pick. Had that... Pardon? I said... Yeah, for that reason and many others, this was a good pick for now, for the time. Yeah, I mean, it's it, we needed some fun, and uh, so I I would definitely recommend this. I mean, of course, there are certain people I know wouldn't appreciate it, but <laughs> we all know those people in our lives, right? Yeah. And still easier to recommend than some John Waters. Oh, I would definitely recommend this over Pink Flamingos. <laughs> that's an acquired safer, taste. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, does that's see. not the first John Waters, unless you really know the person well. I can make that right. judgment. Right, right. And you would, I, I take it you would recommend this as well. Yeah, I, I would, and I would say the the Criterion uh, edition is pretty sweet. I haven't fully explored it. No, I haven't either. I, I looked at a little bit of it, but I, 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 I did like what I saw, and and I, you know, this was made at a point where John Waters, he, you know, wasn't working with the best of budgets. So they've tried to remaster it as much as possible. And yeah, so you'll still, even if you're watching a Blu-ray of it, some of it's still not the clearest, but it's a much better copy than you're going to get and much better sound quality than you're going to get in other editions. Yeah. Because I also have it on um, DVD like an old copy that's uh in like a multi-disc set and okay. i and i'm only keeping that because i there are a couple of the others that i don't have on blu-ray yet so gotta have them somehow yeah and slowly replace exactly well so, awesome yeah well on that note let's take a another quick break and then we will be back to wrap up the show be right back if you enjoyed this show then make sure you check out the other great shows on the legion podcast network like cinema psyops cinema b devour the podcast duncan and Bo come correct exploding heads horror movie podcast friday the 13th get slayed the hell Ming power hour hello this is the doom show hero hero go show kill the cast underwater kaiju from outer space jerry hates action Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shadecast, 
short bus cinema, two drink minimum commentaries, the VD clinic, who will survive horror podcast, and which versus the doomsday clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found. Okay, we are back. And yes, we are here just to wrap up things at the VD clinic. Um, Darren, tell us what we are doing next month. Okay, so next month we are doing the 1990 film adaptation uh, directed by Rob Reiner of Misery based on a... (laughs) <laughs> a book by a writer some people may have heard of, a 1987 book of the same title, of course, by Stephen King. Yes, not the first time we will be venturing into Stephen King territory here. Nope. But seemed to be a fitting January episode. Yeah, I haven't read that one in a long time, so... Yeah, I'm neither neither to reread I. it. Yeah. So it should be should be fun. And um, like I said, I pretty clearly remember the part Stephen King talked about it in ha- his book about writing and stuff. Which Dance is, Macabre? Uh, huh? Dance Macabre? No, his uh or... on writing by Stephen oh, King. Oh, his on writing. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, which is like half semi writer workshop style, and the other half is I was born in Maine. <laughs> okay. I don't know. You have you ever read it? I think I've read part of it. Uh, okay. It's it's one of the ones that I got on audiobook because he does it. Okay. So it's kind of like him telling you about his life and then giving some writing tips or a little uh, exercise. Anyway, yeah, he talks a decent amount about how he came around to working on several of the books. Fortunately, he doesn't go in depth on all of them because he has a billion of them. True. Uh, But you know yeah so well we will get into that then um and i so, would yeah. be remiss and i would be remiss if i didn't say r.i.p and rice since oh, she just yeah. can't, just passed away she did i'm very happy i was able to meet her a few times so oh cool yeah well yeah that was uh, Ripping across the horror fan verse. Exactly. So. Yeah. Hmm. Now I've got to start thinking from February too. And and March. Huh. March it's madness. A, it's all it's all coming up. Exactly. Okay. Well, sounds like we have our work cut out for us for next month. On that note. Thank you, Darren, as always, for joining me. Oh, and thank you, Vanessa, for having me. And thank you, dear listeners, for being here for another episode. And um, closing out another calendar year. Not a podcast year, but (laughs) (laughs) But our last episode of 2021. Um, Yeah. Hopefully, I know we said this last year, that the next year won't be as big of a dumpster fire. (laughs) Here's to hope. Uh, We said that the end of 2020. (laughs) We did. Somebody's jinxing us somewhere. Uh, At least we have a vaccine. 
it's a little we're doing a little bit better <laughs> that's true baby steps <laughs> baby and steps baby steps we're di we're in a different variant and there's still people who won't get vaccinated but we at least but, have you know. some va baby steps baby steps yeah <laughs> yeah so we'll see how about that that'll be about next year we'll see i don't i i, I have i have faith in a lot of uh, all of you out there listening but not as much faith in a lot of other people or <laughs> 40 to 50 percent of other people maybe maybe that's it i wait i think i missed something <laughs> in in uh helping next year be better got you okay yeah sure yeah sure who knows but i, I was wait the math i think i got lost in the math for a moment oh Don't i was, mind me i was looking up vaccination rates yesterday and okay got you uh, yeah. so i think right now as of recording uh 60% of the country is fully vaccinated. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, that's it's for another time for another show, probably. We're only semi soapboxy over here. <laughs> for another show, yes. Yeah. But anyway. Okay. And so on that note, um yes. Thank you again. Um happy holidays. Happy New Happy Year holidays. and all that. Yep. I'm Vanessa saying goodbye. And Darren saying goodbye too. Also goodbye. All the goodbyes. The last goodbye is always hardest. So I will say, I won't sing and get us in copyright trouble. Bye. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs>